Today on the Free Marketeers, we are discussing trade secrets, intellectual property, vaccine production, manufacturing, supply chains, and just a whole bunch of other stuff on global trade matters. All of that coming up right after this. Hey everybody, hope you're doing well. Chris here with another Free Marketeers episode today discussing all sorts of IP and trade related matters. Joining me on today's episode is Professor Mark Schultz and he's the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company Endowed Chair in Intellectual Property Law and the Director of the Intellectual Property and Technology Law Program at the University of Akron School of Law. Professor, thanks very much for being with us. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So I thought we'd start off on the, the issue of trade secrets uh, when, I guess, for the lay person, when you hear that concept and that term, you think about uh, oligarchs and capitalists with their cigars. What what secrets are going on? What are they talking about? How are they how are they deciding what their companies are, are doing with their intellectual property, who they're trading with? Can you just unpack a bit the concept of trade secrets and why it's so important? Sure, sure. So first, let me explain uh, just in, in basic legal terms, what a trade secret is. Uh, but then I think it's important to understand what it's not and what its economic function is. So just to understand what it is, the name is really helpful, trade secret. Uh, it tells you that the, it's information that's used in business uh, and it needs to be information that's that's kept confidential, that's kept protected. In fact, there's generally a requirement for uh, reasonable, uh, reasonable efforts to preserve security secrecy uh what to make that you know a little more clear it's, it simply says look courts won't do for you what you don't do for yourself if you don't actually you know lock lock some doors or or get your employees to sign agreements to not disclose your secrets then um if you're not making an effort then the, the law won't protect you where you didn't at least make some effort so why do they exist like isn't secrecy kind of suspicious or a bad thing um, like you, you, you know, infer, you implied initially, you, you know, it, it can seem that way. Here's the, here's the thing though. Uh, businesses always have the option to keep information secret. Uh, and historically that has been the most fundamental form of, of, I guess, protecting your proprietary information, protecting your innovations. Everybody has that option. Um, and so what does the what does making creating a law a body of law that that further protects uh, these secrets do for us it actually paradoxically leads to more openness collaboration and innovation how could that be um that that seems a little counterintuitive but think of it this way um if you live in a in a, a you know uh, let's say a challenging neighborhood, a less safe neighborhood. And I've, I've been to South Africa several times. And one thing that's striking is, is often you'll see uh, high walls with barbed wire and, and maybe even glass embedded in, in the top of the wall uh, in, in places where people don't feel secure. Um, you know, you can contrast that with maybe a, an area where people do feel more secure, either they're out in the country somewhere they, they feel confident in their protection or they're fortunate to live in a place like Santon where you have private uh, security patrols uh, there where people feel more secure they put up fewer walls right mm -hmm. and metaphorically that's what the law does with trade secrecy um, the the without legal protection you have to ensure that you lock things up tight that you don't share them and that you really trust the people you're working with, really trust the people you're working with. So how do we do that traditionally? Well, you start a family business, for example, and you keep it in the family because you're more likely to trust family, you know, cousins, uh, sons, son, son-in-laws than you are to hire strangers. And that keeps businesses small and keeps their resources smaller. And that's one interesting thing researchers have found is that, in countries with really poor trade secret protection, businesses tend to stay smaller. They tend to be family owned. Uh, historically, another way to protect secrets was through a guild system. Uh, you know, you, you have a very tight system of masters and apprentices, apprentices, 
you, you and in those systems, often what we see is uh, the uh, some sort of threat of exclusion or even uh, implicit threat of violence for people who break the guild's code of silence. Uh, and in that way, uh, secrets were protected historically. Uh, now what we have in, in countries with effective trade secret protection is the ability to you know, pull down some of those walls, uh, hire strangers and train them to do things. And what then the business can rely on is the law to protect them if that person breaks trust. They can also rely on the law to give them recourse if an unscrupulous competitor you know, steals the secrets uh, through, uh, through trespass or criminal action or fraud or even through you know, sort of unusual economic espionage. So this is, in, in these ways, people get more confidence and they're more likely to collaborate. So this is probably the big paradox of trade secrecy. They're not as uh, open uh, as patents. Uh, they're, they're certainly not as, as open and collaborative as simply giving away your information. But if you simply give away your information, you, you may not uh, get a return on your investment. and You may never get that investment in the first place you need to grow your business and execute your business plan. So, so trade secrets have this, this really wonderful paradoxical quality of, of, of encouraging people to open up, encouraging people to collaborate and work together. And, and they do that historically. Now, I, I hate to go on, but you did ask me why they're important. Okay, so why are they important? Okay, so you have this kind of property right that protects information uh, that if businesses take efforts to keep it secret, and it has to be truly secret. It can't be generally known in the business community. Uh, it can't, and 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 it you know it often things that start out as trade secrets do become generally known in the business community through no fault of anybody's, but just the general progress of technology. Things that I'm sure were tremendous manufacturing secrets 50 years ago are, are eventually discovered by, by the rest of, of an, a particular industry. It's just sort of inevitable. There's a march of technology and everybody catches up sooner or later and, and you can't keep something a secret once everybody figures it out. Um, but in the meantime, what trade secrecy allows you to do as a business is to protect your most valuable information and protect the information that go that you're working on in your research and development process. So if you one way I like to think of this, if you think of, say, a, a company's patents or even its trademarks, you know, it eventually develops a, a well-branded product like an Apple phone, iPhone or the like. Um, those may be the pinnacle of value, those patents and, and those brands. But before those things exist, while those products are in development or while those technological advances are in development, they are trade secrets. And the only real way to protect them is through trade secrecy. So a business may spend billions of dollars developing something that, yes, it may eventually disclose to the public, maybe, not always. And if it has a secret manufacturing process or a secret formula, maybe it keeps it secret as long as it can. But there are many things that while they're being worked on, they're tremendously valuable, but they don't yet qualify for a patent. We only award patents to fully developed inventions, things that one of the requirements for a patent is, is we, uh, that it be the invention be capable of industrial application. Well, that can take many years and many failures and much work, but all of that work, all of that information has value. Imagine a business on the very verge of, you know, of a great breakthrough and it spent five years and $3 billion uh, working toward that breakthrough. And they don't yet have it quite, but their competitors would find that five years of information, <laughs> that $3 billion worth of work, very valuable to take and use and get to the finish line at about the same time without doing the work. Um, and that's the, the last thing I'd say, the one of the wonderful things about trade secrecy is that it doesn't stop anyone else from doing their own work. You see, this is what some would call an exception to trade secrecy, but it's also maybe just part of the definition. Trade secrets protect your own work. You have to do your own work 
and nobody can take that work from you. But if they do their own work and develop the same thing, unlike a patent, they can also use it. So all trade secrets do is protect the work that somebody has done and it can't be taken by an unscrupulous employee or an unscrupulous competitor. Um, but as long as those people do their own work outside of the company, not using its information or research, they also can achieve the same innovations. So in this way, you know, trade secrets allow openness and collaboration. And so they're really important to the innovation ecosystem. Like I said, to go back to my metaphor, if the patents and trademarks are the peaks of the mountain, the trade secrets are the rest of the mountain range. And you don't have a peak, you don't have a top of the mountain unless you have the rest of the mountain range. So you need the trade secrets. And the very last thing I'll say about their value, just quite simply, is that they're very, they're the most relied upon form of intellectual property for small businesses, for large businesses, uh, for all businesses. And this isn't just an assertion. This is the something that has been researched extensively throughout the world. In particular, the European Union and the US have had both private researchers and public inquiries. They've done surveys. They've They've looked at this in many ways and what the usual response is consistently is that businesses rate trade secrets as one of their most important strategic advantages in business, more important than patents, more important than trademarks or copyrights, falling maybe just behind being first to market. Um, but other than that, they consider it one of their most important business advantages. And it's so it's the most relied upon form of trade of intellectual property and also considered the most valuable form of intellectual property by businesses. And so I think that tells you something about just uh, just what its place is in the world. But oddly, it's been undervalued and underexplored up until now, but it's becoming far more recognized as important. Yeah, we definitely, I think 99.5% of our energy and analysis is spent on patents and other forms of IP and not necessarily on trade secrets, which is partly why I wanted to get you on to discuss the concept and just the, the implementation there of, um, you know, the, all the sort of impl the implications of, of trade secrets as, as a both theoretical concept and a practical um, sort of useful idea for innovation. So now couching this in the whole uh, production and churn out of COVID-19 vaccines. Um, South Africa, the president of South Africa, Cyril Ramaphosa, has often over the last year or two, and he's not the only public representative, but said that IP is blocking um, Africa's access to vaccines. It's inhibiting Africa's ability to produce its own vaccines. Now, you can please correct me if I'm wrong here, but from my rudimentary understanding, I, I've thought about it in this way: we can do away with the the, the patents, the IP that certain uh, vaccine production companies have. That doesn't mean the next day a ready-made factory will pop up in Johannesburg with the necessary skills, personnel, people to churn out those vaccines. I feel like it's a bit of a focus in the wrong, in the wrong, the focus is to the wrong target. I feel like a lot of other policy and investment work could be done, which could set African countries up better for their own vaccine production instead of doing away with IP, which, you know, helps to protect and incentivize the technological progress in the first place. What do you think of the, not the obsession, maybe that's unkind, but like this over, 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 I think, over, too much of a focus on, the IP issue, quote unquote. Sure. Uh, yeah, it is. It is. There is too great of a focus on it. And I think <laughs> in many ways, it's because it's almost in, in a certain sense, an easy answer. You can, you can sit, you, you can hold a press conference and right. uh, announce that you're, you're going to break a patent. You can, uh, pr you can sit in a conference room in Geneva, Switzerland and make this proposal. And it's something as, as, as obscure as intellectual property rights may seem to some people, uh, they're, they're far more understandable and far more within the, the easy scope of government to do something with the stroke of a pen uh, about, as opposed to manufacturing capacity, which is, is a complex, m complex many-factored problem that requires 
the kind of technical uh, specialization and knowledge that, that only a handful of people have in the world, uh, especially for some of these newer vaccines. So I think that's one explanation uh, is that there's a temptation to look for uh, a villain and an easy answer, whereas the the uh, the the real the real uh, real solution requires a, a great deal of hard, obscure work and obscure knowledge about supply chains, about uh, technology, and about uh, building a capacity and tapping into existing comp uh, capacity in terms of education and expertise and developing that if, if a country doesn't have it. Uh, so I think that's the, the real challenge. I, I think there's nothing, uh, there's nothing that innately stops any South African or Indian or other person from, uh, from developing and manufacturing vaccines. We all share an innovative and creative capacity. Some of us are much more skilled at science than others, but it's, it has nothing to do with where we were born or who we are. It has everything to do with the institutions where we live. And it's interesting to consider when you really, I've, I've spent the, the last six months uh, studying the issue of the fight against COVID and intellectual property. I've had the opportunity to talk to manufacturing experts engaged in manufacturing vaccines. Um, and one of many things that strikes you is that they come from all over the world. You know, the founders of BioNTech, uh, the German company, are from Turkey. Uh, they're, 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 you know, German citizens, but they're of Turkish uh, descent. The, you know, many of, of the uh, people working in European and American pharmaceutical companies are first generation immigrants, uh, often from country, the very countries that uh, are, are saying that, you know, they're being deprived of the, the opportunity to develop. The people are, are vote, the experts are moving, they're voting with their feet, and they're going places where their talents can be realized best. So uh, that is partly a matter of, of institutions. It's partly a matter of material circumstances. Certainly you need the infrastructure and, and the wealth and other opportunities, but it's also a matter of institutions. Uh, do, can you rely on getting a return on your investment? Uh, will your hard work be taken away from you, or or can you you can you continue to develop it and and achieve and achieve more based on it? Uh, that is often the key question that differentiates uh, differentiates the success of various countries um, in developing a vaccine capacity. Now, there's been a lot of talk in South Africa the last two years, I mean, even before COVID, just around structural reform. So making the country, getting the country back on a more pro-growth path. At the moment, we have a 44% unemployment rate on the expanded definition, 74% youth unemployment rate. So in terms of institutions, what you mentioned now, can you explain and, and highlight some of the institutions that, that more developing countries that they should pursue, which would enable them then to have more innovation, more growth, more job creation, sort of over the long term and nothing is a quick fix and there's no sort of utopia. I don't think anyone portends that free markets are going to provide for everyone's wants and needs completely and there'll be 100% employment. But on average, when you live in freer markets, your quality of life is better than when there's less. So just your thoughts on institutions and, and what, what they mean and how they concretely sort of are realized. Certainly. Well, there there are certainly things that government does particularly well. Uh, we, we may dispute that on the, you know, at, at the far end, but uh, I think there are certain public goods the government supplies that are extremely important to building your innovative base. And that starts with education, uh, ensuring that you have a literate, well-educated uh, population that, that has the opportunity to succeed. Um, <clears throat> and that's, that, of course, starts, you know, starts very young. But it also uh, is important that you have a, a well-developed system of higher education. And that, that helps develop your talent. But of course, the problem is that sometimes that talent leaves if there are not other conditions uh, that are conducive to success. And you know, this, this is, is particularly a problem in a developing country, but, but candidly, 
we in the U.S. experience this too. Sometimes uh, some of our bright, best and brightest students in one state uh, will, you know, in the middle of the country, will migrate to California, Silicon Valley, or, or to Austin, Texas, to, to you know, they take their talents there and develop them. So, uh, so this is, you know, this is always a challenge at a, a local and national scale. Is is to have a, an environment that's conducive to people developing their talents. But then what happens next is you people ultimately intellectual property is one of those important institutions that's part of the rule of law. People need to have confidence that when they collaborate with others, when they make plans, uh, when they make commitments, when they take risks, that they will have an opportunity to succeed. Um, and indeed, that their success won't be counted against them in that if they make something useful and helpful, uh, that that thing won't be taken away from them because it's useful and helpful. <clears throat> and I think people sometimes misunderstand this about intellectual property. They see it as just a way to uh, have exclusive rights over something. It's often called a monopoly, uh, which is maybe technically right, but often not really true because you know, does you know, does uh, does any particular you know restaurant have a monopoly on making food, or any particular snack manufacturer have a, a monopoly on making potato crisps? No, it, they may have their own brand, but they don't have a monopoly. And even in the drug market, uh, we see right now relevant to COVID, we see ver a variety of vaccines, but maybe you know more on a more uh, a more everyday level, you know, when you go to choose, say, a pain reliever, you have a variety of pain relievers to choose from. There's no, you know, even if there, if there's a new patented pain reliever, uh, a company won't be able to to uh, to charge, you know, a hundred dollars a pill for this headache medicine because there are there is competition, <laughs> and so uh, intellectual property is is not just a, a, some kind of monopoly that allows people to charge high prices and, and thus encourages them to innovate. There, there's something to that. You know, they, they can get a return on their investment. They have an opportunity for a return on their investment. But the story is really more complex. What intellectual property as an institution provides is an opportunity for people to secure their investments, both their own labor and other people's money. And uh, I remember I, I had the opportunity before the pandemic, before he was world famous, to talk to the academic founder of Moderna, uh, one of the you know, great vaccine innovators. And uh, his name's Dr. Derek Rossi. And we, we talked about the role of intellectual property and in, in biopharma. This was at the end of 2019 when COVID was just uh, arising, arising in China. And you know, Dr. Rossi said to me, you know, you could be working on the coolest thing. That's how he put it. You could be working on the coolest thing, um, the most interesting science, uh, but without intellectual property, without that security, nobody will invest in it. And because nobody will invest in it, these are my words now, it won't get developed. It takes a lot of money to, inv to develop a product. It takes a vast sum to develop a pharmaceutical. But even, even a small business developing a, a more mundane product needs investment. And people who put money into your company won't do so. Uh, you know, people who, who might be interested in your product won't do so unless they have some security that their investment won't be taken away from them through copying, through appropriation. And so this, this fundamental role in securing investment so you can actually take a great idea and turn it into a product that goes to market, that is where intellectual property plays this really fundamental role. It, it provides security to investors. And, and why do investors avoid insecure investments? Not out of spite. You know, you're not going to see venture capitalists and, and investors, you know, be private stock investors say, oh, I'm mad that the government, you know, waived IP rights or took away IP rights, so I won't invest anymore out of spite. No, it's just they, they will start to avoid places where their money is at greater risk. And they, their money is always at risk. Most new businesses fail. Most products, new products fail. 
and most medicines, definitely most medicines fail. And so if you're in the business of investing in biotech startups, for example, you have to accept that you're likely to lose your money most of the time uh, because they're going to fail. What you can't tolerate is losing your money because they succeed, <laughs> because they succeed and everyone says they need the product um, you're, and you'll lose your money then, then it's just a lose-lose proposition. You, you either fail or you succeed, but fail because you succeed. What does that mean then? The investor says, well, I guess there's safer places to put my money. I could invest in food and beverage or hotels or, or something probably less socially productive and useful, but safer for their money. And it's not just because they're selfish either, because a lot of times people are investing other people's money. It could be your pension funds they're investing, and you certainly want them to invest it wisely. And so intellectual property is this institution that, that creates confidence in investing that then gives innovators the resources they need to actually develop a product to take it to market and and taking it to market means doing all the hard work to, to create a product that actually can be sold on the market. You know, there's, there's one thing to develop a pharmaceutical idea in the, the lab that works on mice. There's a long road in many years until you go from mouse to human application and then through testing. Um, and then even you have to spend on distribution. You have to invest in creating a, an infrastructure to distribute. All of those things are costly and risky. There are many points of failure. And the one point of failure you can't have is uh, the point of failure that that is caused by success that, you know, if you allow people to freely copy or governments to appropriate because of success, then you destroy the investment that fuels the innovation and the uh, and the uh, the the investment in building uh, a manufacturing capacity. Just looking a little bit forward and not to put you on the spot in terms of uh, sort of predicting and, and projecting as it were, but the last few years, the sort of uh, broadly the international trade uh, regime as it were has been undermined in some ways by countries like China who, you know, try and do their innovation through stealing intellectual property, some companies and, and individuals who do it there. So looking forward, how do more liberal democracies and countries try and deal with that challenge because on the one hand you have very strong concerns from developing countries which still includes china in some ways how you know that the, they want to have access to the to the intellectual property to get their citizens eye up to have innovation to have quality of life improvements but at the same time you want that innovation and the ip protections to encourage investment in the, in the sort of liberal stronger more developed countries how do you is there a way to balance these things and how do you think it might shake out are we going to see a bit more will we see the international order break down a bit more in the next few years well i i do fear for the international order um i think there there's been a loss of confidence in it uh among citizens and policymakers, but but I think that's that's a terrible thing because uh, what we've seen in the last generation are billions of people lifted out of abject poverty, uh, and a lot of that has to do with with gains from trade. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there there's a fair argument, a real problem when you invite actors into the new the international trade system who don't play by the rules. Um, and I think there was a certain naivete among policymakers, and and I'm old enough that I can say I was naivete, I, naive. I wasn't a policymaker, but but uh, I invite and you know participated in policy discussions, organized debates, uh, and the like. And and I I you know only saw the good side of free trade and assumed that like so many did that inviting China into the system, uh, giving them a stake in the system uh, that. Uh, helping them to develop economically would be followed by a uh, political liberalization. Obviously, we haven't seen that. And so we, we have to rethink that globally. Uh, on the other hand, what we have seen in China 
is a tremendous achievement in lifting vast numbers of people out of poverty. Now, one of the reasons vast numbers of people were in poverty were because of the, the cruel and, and sometimes insane economic decisions of the, the Communist Party in the 50s and 60s uh, that, that destroyed their economy and, and, and caused tens of millions to, to starve or perish. Uh, so they, they had a long way to come. But one of the things the Chinese recognized is that innovation has value. And they don't, you know, the, the Chinese government and the Chinese people don't just uh, copy other people's innovations. They've become innovators in their own right. Uh, and, and this is a lesson for many other developing countries. You can look to China for the value of investing in an, innova in an innovation system. They have an efficient patent office that grants patents promptly. Uh, they, they endeavor to ensure that, that government funded research is, is, gets an app, is applied and developed into products. Um, and they, they have developed an, an effective system for adjudicating intellectual property rights. So you might say, well, wait a minute, Professor Schultz, this sounds like a, a pretty rosy picture of China, that they're, they're doing the right things. The problem is, is that you have the appearance of the rule of law without the, the reality, the complete reality. The Chinese government uh, is, is happy to have a strong intellectual property system for things that it doesn't consider of strategic interest. So I suppose if you, uh, if you find some, some small business infringing your, your fast food trademark in, in you know, one of the, the less prominent Chinese cities and, and they're not allied with a party member, and even if they are, you probably can get a fair adjudication. Uh, but if you are a, if you have invested in a strategic technology, um, the, the, the thumb will be on the scales against you when it comes to enforcing your rights. Let me, let me put this in a more concrete way. There's, there's two ways to, to measure it. China, um, I, I was speaking at a forum, uh, uh, talking about trade secret protection worldwide, which is something I study uh, and, and can talk about the, the comparative uh, effectiveness of various country systems. And I was saying one of the challenges in China historically has been to get be able to get preliminary relief to get in what's called an injunction in the US, but to get preliminary emergency relief to stop people from wrongly acting. Um, and that's been difficult in China. And the lawyer on the panel next to me said, well, actually in the last year, I've been able to get injunctions and they're increasingly available in China. <clears throat> and we were all very interested and we listened to him and he explained his experience and we thought, well, that's a good sign. And then one audience member raises his hand and, and asks him, would you advise a client uh, who uh, was, was uh, working in an area that uh, the Chinese government considered to be strategic technology? This would be AI, data, green technology, and so on. But would you advise that client to bring a lawsuit and seek an injunction? And the lawyer's response next to me was, oh, no, no, don't. That, that would not be wise or worthwhile. So I think that that says something. I said there was another way to measure it, and this is subtle, but it's been tracked by researchers. Um, it, if you look at technologies that the Chinese government has identified as strategically important, and then you look at, at uh, the rate of granting patents to foreigners in those technological areas, you will find a statistically significant difference. You'll find that the foreigners are more likely to not get their patents granted. So what do we have? We have a system of that supports innovation, that's subtly tilted toward domestic innovation, that generally doesn't allow rampant piracy, but is not reliable for the rule of law. Um, and so you, you have China as both an example and a warning. Uh, it's an example that, that, you know, yes, intellectual property is important. It has raised the standard of living for China. It has helped China develop new industries. And yes, China is contributing new technologies to the world. On the other hand, uh, China is, is subtly discriminating against foreigners. And 
maybe there'd be a temptation by unscrupulous policymakers to follow China's example. But remember, there's no market in the world as large as China. China is always the exception. I, I remember that in college. That was, you know, maybe one of the things I remember from 35 years ago. My U.S. my diplomatic history professor um, said, you know, one of his themes was China is always the exception, and it's because of the desire for the Chinese market. Uh, you know, various governments have done, arguably unscrupulous. No, not arguably unscrupulous things in, in the colonial period, uh, terrible things. Uh, but businesses have taken foolish risks because they're pursuing that short-term profit because the market is so attractive and so large. I couldn't recommend this cor policy course to even a South Africa or a Malaysia or, or any other developing or middle-income country because uh, they're not the exceptions. Uh, you know, if you have a if, if people can't trust the rule of law in your country, they won't invest. This is something that uh, is is not subtle. It's not hidden. Uh, this is something that business executives are trained to look for. This is something they ask their lawyers for advice on. When I practice at an international law firm, we often were asked to write a memorandum. We had offices in many countries, and we they said we're thinking of locating in five different countries. Uh, can you give us answer a short questionnaire about each of those countries? You know what's the What's the reliability of the courts? What are their intellectual property laws, including trade secrets? And we would supply that information, you know, it, and it was sort of a beauty contest, right? And so businesses are quite aware that, that you know, they, they want to protect the value of their investment and they go where their investment's safe, except sometimes they make an exception for China. So we need, so you asked me what we do as a global system. I think, you know, liberal democracies uh, need to ensure that their intellectual property systems work to support the innovation of their own citizens. Uh, they need to recognize intellectual property as a domestic development issue, not just a trade issue, not just a negotiating piece that you negotiate with your trading partners, not something you withhold from the United States or Europe in order to get concessions, but rather something that supports your own innovators and creators. Um, and you incur you you have strong institutions for your own country's sake, like China has recognized. Um, and then globally, what we need to do is ensure that we have rules that don't allow cheating. We're all better off if China innovates fairly. Um, you know, I'm getting older now. I, I, I'd love to have a, a million Chinese researchers working to prolong my life. I'll, I'll gladly pay for whatever medicines they, they create. Um, and so I, I want China to innovate. I want India to innovate, and South Africa to innovate. Uh, you know, no, no medicine, you know, ha medicines have no nationality. Great products have no nationality. So I want those countries to innovate, and I hope they do. But let's ensure that they don't undermine the entire system and the incentives in the system by, by cheating. And so that's what I would try to fix. Just a final question I had for you, uh, Professor, was around the Africa continental free trade area. And the if you think, I mean, obviously working in South Africa and advocating for more pro-free uh, trade policies and ideas, I, I maybe sometimes I like to think that the agreement is just going to be great. It'll be implemented. Things will work very well. What are the biggest sort of challenges you foresee for the AFCFTA and just what do you think in terms of low hanging fruit in terms of where, you know, we don't have to focus on the whole thing being implemented by 2030, but where African governments and countries can just focus their energy and attention. I mean, African governments in general have limited fiscal resources now with higher uh, debt repayment costs. So they can't necessarily do stimulus or other big investments like other countries, but where they can really focus on getting the, the biggest bang for the buck, as it were. Right. So I think, first of all, I think the idea is brilliant. It's mm. exciting. Uh, I think I think everyone understands that it's it's a challenging road. Uh, whatever you think of the EU in its current form, it, it's been on this road for decades and it, it's, it's gone far beyond just a free trade area. But we've seen the many years and many challenges it's had. Uh, but where is the low hanging fruit? I think the, uh, you know, I think uh, one thing that's always struck me when I look at, at trade in Africa is 
one often sees that the trade routes are so circuitous that uh, products have to go uh, have to go far away to be to be shipped, you know, to from one part of the continent to another, from one country to another. Uh, so I think the low hanging fruit has a lot uh, has a lot to do with simply pulling down barriers, uh, making sure that uh, that trucks aren't backed up at borders. Um, I've, I've spent, I've actually traveled, uh, you know, across land borders in, in Africa and uh, it's, it can be a slow experience. Uh, it can be challenging. You, you could, I, I, and luckily for me, it was a matter of half a day at the border, not like some stories I've heard where you, you know, people, truck drivers spend a few days or more waiting to get across borders. Something that simple. Um, makes you know, fixing something that simple uh, makes products cheaper, um, makes uh, more products available to consumers, makes businesses start to think about expanding and employing more people because now you know it's they're no longer stuck on an, an, a, a, a metaphorical island uh, you know, that they actually can ship into to countries across borders. So I'd say you know, uh, uh, harmonizing the, the laws about transporting products, uh, pulling down barriers. Uh, you know, it's it's instructive to go to Europe and cross a, bar a border and not even realize you've crossed one. Um, and to think about, you know, I, I, I have some you know, Irish uh, ancestors and to think about at least before, you know, still after Brexit, but, you know, think about how there was, such a difference between the Irish Republic and the and the the uh, Northern Ireland it, that that there was a hard border not so long ago and and what difference does that make and now people just freely travel and goods freely flow between the places you can have a business you can have a business that starts in Dublin and you can easily send your people and products to Belfast without even a second thought uh, that if you could do that if that I think is is perhaps the most low hanging fruit uh, is to to pull down tariffs. Um, those are a, a monetary barrier, and to pull down uh, pull down the barriers to free movement. Uh, I, I get that there's challenges with regard to moving labor and people, but if at least goods can move freely, uh, that would be a wonderful start. And uh, I'd love to see a future trade map map of Africa, where you know all the the well lit up routes on the map are are internal, uh, as as opposed to skipping around out you know outside uh, the continent or even going to Europe and and back to a different African country. So that's what I'd advocate. Yeah, it's, I think that's that's very sound advice and uh, a great note. On which to end because we all want the AFC FDA to be implemented. Let's start doing it in the in the best way as possible, just making the the flow of goods easier across the continent. But on that note, thank you very much, uh, Professor Schultz, for your time today. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Uh, to the viewers and listeners, we hope you enjoyed this episode. As always, if you found value in it, please like the video before you leave and also subscribe to our channel if you haven't yet. Look forward to more content from us in the coming days and weeks. Until next time, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.